We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Great to see everybody here this morning. I hope you had an incredible Thanksgiving, uh, sharing my Thanksgiving hack with you. By the way, if anyone ever asks you what kind of pie do you want, the answer is yes. All pies. It's a, not a uh, multiple choice question. It's an all of the above question. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and, and I would love to meet you after service. So come, come find me. Uh, one of my favorite things about the job that I have is being able to, to stand in, in a place to be able to open up God's Word and help uh, a community of believers understand what God wants us to, to know about becoming more like Him. So I'm glad you're here. We're wrapping up our series called Rhythms. We're talking about some spiritual disciplines that all of us should have in our lives. And there's something about a rhythm. I don't know about you. Anyone else notice that rhythms are really good for a couple things. One, a rhythm really kind of can help you relax. Maybe you put on a metronome or some sort of calming uh, rhythmic music and it can help you fall asleep. But you could also put on something with a little bit of a, maybe a faster rhythm. And I, one of my favorite things to do, if you've ever been at a wedding that I've been at as well, you know that my wife and I, we love to dance. And rhythm is good for that as well, isn't it? Uh, there's something about rhythm. We understand that rhythm is the, these things that, that happen uh, at regular intervals that are important in different areas of our lives. And that's why we've been talking about these, these rhythms. On week one, we talked about the rhythm of worship. We talked about how worship is an important thing to have regularly a part of your life. In fact, a corporate worship, which is what we do on Sundays when we gather here together to worship corporately, One of the best things about the rhythm of a weekly corporate worship experience is what it is, is it's a moment to recalibrate for just a moment. You recalibrate, and essentially what you do in that moment is you say, all right, recalibrate, God is good and I am not. Remind yourself, every time you worship, what you're doing is you're ascribing worth to where it belongs, which is to God and not to yourself. So that's really powerful. Another type of rhythm we talked about last week was the rhythm of rest. We recognize that all of us have been commanded in Scripture at least once weekly, right, to be restful, to make sure that if we want to be like Jesus, Jesus, you know, God, even in the creation account, showed us the importance of resting uh, once a week. So we we see the importance of that. Today, we're going to talk about some other spiritual disciplines uh, in our rhythms. We're going to talk specifically about the spiritual discipline of, of prayer, and the spiritual discipline of the intake of God's Word, spending time in God's Word together. And we're going to be able to do that together. Now, when you see the word discipline or disciplines, it doesn't conjure up really good feelings, does it? When you hear someone say discipline, for the most part, we hear the word discipline and it comes with some negative connotations, doesn't it? Well, I want you to know that if you hear discipline and you're like, that doesn't sound fun, you're not alone. Even, even Scripture, right, in Hebrews 12, 11 says, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. And if you were, grew up in a house where discipline was painful, then you were disciplined properly, okay? <laughs> uh, if you, if, if discipline is, is painful, and when it's happening, it doesn't feel good, right? When, when discipline comes, and whether that's uh, physical pain or, or maybe uh, uh, you, you can't enjoy something you enjoyed, something's taken away, it, pain, discipline is painful. We don't enjoy it. So this concept of it, trying to convince a whole congregation to, to embrace spiritual discipline can be kind of a, a hard challenge, but we want to look at what God's Word says about discipline. So if you really think about discipline in, in, in a couple ways. One, if you were to go to a uh, Christmas concert, and there was a, let's just say you're going to, to watch 
uh, a, a big grand piano on the stage, and a pianist gets on and sits down on the bench and plays this incredible Christmas music for you, and you're able to enjoy that. Here's what you're experiencing. You are watching the fruit of someone else's discipline. You're not watching the thousands of hours that they prepared for that moment. You're not seeing that from a young age they started learning this skill and they they spent time practicing and they didn't give up when the rest of us all quit, right? They all kept going and they were they were they put hours and hours and thousands of hours into this moment where now you're getting to you're getting to see the fruit of their discipline. But you didn't get to see the discipline. You get to see the the fruit of it. And the same is really true for us in a lot of ways, right? Uh, when we put discipline behind something, there's going to be something to show for it, but most people aren't going to see the work that actually went in behind the scenes. I have another example of that. Can, I, I'm a dad, so I like to brag on my kids like everyone else. You know, my, my kids are all homeschooled, and one of the f- cool things that comes from homeschooling is that uh, at least my, my oldest daughter right now, all my kids are a little bit ahead of where they're supposed to be in school. My, my oldest daughter is technically a junior, but she's all done with all her graduation requirements. So we're just trying to figure out what should she do for the next couple years. And one of the things that we've decided to do is, hey, instead of doing any sort of math, since you've taken care of all of your math requirements, and instead of doing some sort of literature, you've done all of your literature and reading requirements, why don't you just focus this year on, on your SAT preparation, right? That's math prep, and that's literature and, and reading prep and all those vocabulary and all that stuff. So she's just been spending time all, all this first, you know, half of this year taking preparatory tests and, and SAT tutoring and figuring out what things aren't quite right and what she needs to learn and, and retaking those and, and learning and doing better. And then she went and took her first SA, official SAT test and she scored in the 1500s. I'm so excited, right? I not only am excited to see the fruit of her labor, but now I don't have to pay for college. So I'm excited about that. Um, so here's my point. When somebody disciplines themselves to a particular task, there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes. And the result of that, other people are able to often notice. It it shows itself in the form of fruit. Spiritual discipline shows itself in the form of fruit. But if you really think about it, it's, it's things, and when it comes to spiritual disciplines, these are the things that you do in your life that most other people aren't going to notice that you're doing them. God's certainly going to notice when you're spending time in his word. He's certainly there in conversation with you as you're spending time reading his words and speaking to him in prayer. He is certainly aware. But most other people aren't. But they're going to notice a fruit. They're going to notice the result of you having these rhythms in your life. See, here's a definition. Spiritual disciplines are the habitual choices that we make to promote spiritual growth in our lives. You're going to notice two really key words in this definition. One, these are habitual things. These are things that happen rhythmically. They're things that that we work into the habit of and the rhythm of our life. And the more that you do them, the easier they come because they are habits that we need to form in our lives. The second word, though, I want you to see up here is the word choices. You have to choose for these things to be a part of your life. These things don't just happen accidentally. They don't happen naturally. You have to decide for yourself on a regular basis to work these spiritual disciplines into your life if you want to promote spiritual growth in your life. Another way to kind of look at spiritual disciplines, if you think about Zacchaeus, have you guys all heard the story of Zacchaeus? The Bible describes Zacchaeus as a wee little man, right? The Bible doesn't say that, a song about him. And we know that Zacchaeus was short, so he he climbs up in a tree so that he can see Jesus. And what you're doing when you practice spiritual disciplines is you are positioning yourself in a way that whenever Jesus moves, you get to experience it and see it for yourself. What you're doing is you're placing yourself in a situation, in a, a, in a place where you get to be a part of the movement of God around you. So what I want to do this morning is share with you seven truths, 
key biblical truths about spiritual disciplines. If you're taking notes, if you got one of those note sheets on the way in, this is your fill in the blanks, all right? But here's the first one. The first thing I want you to know is that the goal of spiritual discipline is to become like Jesus. It's very simple. The reason that we want to practice spiritual disciplines in our lives is so that we can become more like Christ. If you look at Romans 8, in verse 29, it says this, For God knew his people in advance. He chose them to, you ready for this? Say these next four words with me out loud. Become like his son. God, the moment you gave your life to Christ, that sometimes we think, you know, what is the, the, the most important thing is that I just, I commit my life to Jesus. That is certainly important. That is a very, the most important thing. But listen, beyond that, it says that not only did Jesus choose us to, to be saved, but not only, are, does every, not only do I know for certain that God loves every single person in this room and he wants you to step into a relationship with him, every single one of us, but it doesn't end there. The next part of that is that he then wants you to become like his son. You don't just say, I want to I, I follow Jesus and just stop. No, you, you step into a relationship, and from that relationship, you begin a process of being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. The reason we practice these spiritual disciplines is so that we become, become like Jesus it goes on in that verse, it says, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You see, we all know the, the value of, we, we all, sometimes we, we see somebody that we, we admire, we want to emulate. We do all sorts of crazy things in our culture, don't we, to emulate people that we admire. We, we wear the numbers of other men on our backs in the form of a jersey, don't we? Like, man, I like that guy. I want to, uh, that, that guy, I admire him. So I'm going to put that number on. We'll, we'll go to a, a training camp, right, to learn how to swing the bat the way that guy does it. You know, we'll put their shoes on and we'll put, like, we, we reckon that nothing's wrong with any of that, right? We emulate someone because we want to be like them or we want to improve our skills. We want to learn how, you know, you go to a certain dance convention because you want to learn how to pirouette the way that ballerina does it, right? We want to, we want to embrace Somebody who, who can do things better than we can so we can become better at, and, and ultimately the truth is in our, in our faith, we want to emulate the perfect person of Jesus Christ. That's the, the goal of spiritual disciplines is to become like Jesus. Here's a second thing. Jesus practiced spiritual disciplines. You'll already notice that this one really kind of points back to number one. If our goal is to become like Jesus and Jesus practiced spiritual disciplines, then we should practice spiritual disciplines to become like Jesus. And it's this big circle. Well, we see that Jesus himself practiced these spiritual disciplines. In Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 38, it says, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well. I will preach to them too. That is why I came. I love how Jesus models the fact that he has a purpose. He woke up that day with a very particular goal, which is to go into other towns and preach to them too. But how does he start his day? He shows us the importance of practicing spiritual discipline. It says he got alone and he went off to spend time with God, the Father. In fact, we even see that he goes off and he doesn't even tell his disciples where he's at. Let that be a little side note for you. If you ever have an experience in your life where you're like, I just don't know where Jesus is at right now, go find him. Go find him. He hasn't gone anywhere. You maybe are just struggling to know where he's at. And the disciples show you, listen, when, when Jesus woke up that morning, he went out to find an isolated place to spend time with the Father. He modeled for us spiritual discipline of prayer. If we want to become like him, we ought to model that as well. Here's a third truth about spiritual disciplines. Number three, you, capital Y-O-U, have to do the work. 
some, not someone else. You have to do the work, not someone else. As Paul was writing a letter to a young pastor named Timothy, this is what he said in the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy. It says, train, what's the word? Yourself. Train yourself to be godly, Timothy. Timothy, you can get this idea that as a young pastor, you need to go out and train others how to be godly. But what Paul says is first, start with you. You need to train you how to be godly. And it goes on, it says, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. He says, listen, Timothy, it's, it's good to, to stay in physical shape. It's good to work out your muscles, but it's more important to train for godliness. It's good to work out your mind. You know, play your daily wordle and your Sudokus and all that stuff. That's all good. Work out your mind. But it's more important to train in godliness. It's great to work on your flexibility and to get all your, your you know, whatever. But it's more important to grow in, in godliness. That's what's more important. And he says, you need to train yourself. You need to do it. For a lot of us, right, when we were young, somebody else created some rhythms in our life. You know, you might have had a parent that says, no, every week we go and corporately we worship together. And you were dragged to church, whether you wanted to go or not. For some of you, maybe you were told, no, you need to sit down and open up God's word and spend time in it. Maybe for some of us, right, when we were really little, you were told you had to go take a nap. Well, these spiritual disciplines of rest and worship and spending time in God's word and spending time in prayer, these are things that maybe at some point somebody made you do them, but at some point we have to put away childish things and we have to grow up into a spiritual adults and we have to take ownership of these things for ourselves. Nobody's gonna do it for you. You have to buy in. Here's what I mean by this concept of you have to buy in. I have a, a, a fun fact about me, one thing I really enjoy doing when we get family together, maybe some of you just did this as you had family together for Thanksgiving, we like to sit around a table together and play poker. Anyone else? How you pull out all your change, right, and everybody, everybody gets some, and you're just kind of playing. Well, we, we play Texas Hold'em. And one thing, uh, we were on a vacation a couple weeks ago in Virginia, and the resort we were at, they had this Texas Hold'em night that you could go to, and it was free. Right? And I don't know if any of you have ever played Texas Hold'em before, but one thing you'll learn very quickly is when people are playing for free, they play differently, don't they? Because there's nothing for them to lose. They'll be looking at their cards, or I got a two and a seven. Ah, I'm all in. It's not my money, right? I'm not, I don't have anything invested in this game. If I lose, I lose nothing. If I win, I win nothing. Well, while we were there, we decided not to do that. We decided instead, you know, all my, my sister and her, my, my brother-in-law and my wife and my daughters and my, my nephews and my niece, we all sat around one big table together and we're like, listen, everyone's got to buy in. Five bucks, five bucks. Because what happens when people buy in is they play differently. Now it's their money that they're going to lose if they play poorly. It's their money that they're going to win if they play well, Right? And for some of them, you realize at some point about halfway through the game that they're playing with their parents' money and they don't really have any buy-in at all. <laughs> but here's the point. When it comes to spiritual disciplines, you have to buy in. You have to take it seriously yourself or it's not going to work. You have to do the work, not someone else. I wrote a few thoughts about this I think it's important to note. Number one, if you don't discipline yourself, the world will do it for you. I repeat that. If you don't discipline yourself, the world will do it for you. And you're not going to like the result. Discipline takes intentionality. You want to be disciplined towards the right things and towards good things. How about this? This is a quote from Plato I found. It says, for a man to conquer himself is the first and noblest of all victories. We need to learn how to conquer and discipline ourselves before we worry about the people around us. Now, we're so concerned about what everyone else is doing. Why don't you just work on developing the spiritual disciplines in your own life first? How about this? Number four, biblical truth about spiritual disciplines. 
Practicing spiritual disciplines is not selfish. It is not selfish. If you've ever been on a commercial plane before, you know that at some point after you squeeze into your little seat, right, and you put your tray table where it's supposed to be and you're sitting and buckled, right, someone's going to get up in the aisle and they're going to show you the whole safety procedures of how everything works. They're going to show you how to buckle yourself in and how to unbuckle yourself. And at some point they're going to grab that little mask, right, and they're going to drop it down. And what are they going to tell you? They're going to say, make sure to put your own mask on first before assisting others. Now, I don't know about you, but as a parent, right, I have children, a wife, people I care about in my family. My natural instinct was, man, if one of those comes down, I want to make sure they're all taken care of before I worry about my own well-being. Taking care of myself first seems selfish, right? But the truth is, the reason they tell you to put your own mask on first is because if you're incapacit- incapacitated, if, if you don't have enough oxygen, the pressure changes and whatever, and you pass out, you're no good to help the people next to you. Take care of making sure that you can keep consciousness so you can help the people around you. Essentially, spiritual disciplines are not selfish because, uh, listen, I get it. A lot of us are really busy. If you're a parent in this room of young kids, at least the phase of life I'm in right now, it feels like uh, they all have places they need to go today. I got to run them to the nutcracker practice. I got to take them to this. I got to go run this one over there. I got to do that. We got to, you got to cook something. We got to make some meals. We got to you know, do some laundry. We have a list of stuff that's got to be done. So for a lot of us, we think, well, if I were to just go into this room and close the door and be isolated for 30 minutes or an hour, that just would be selfish of me. But can I say this? Practicing spiritual disciplines is probably the most, one of the most selfless things you can do because all of your relationships, all of your decisions, all of your goals, your choices, all the actions you take throughout the day will be blessed because you first spent time putting on your own mask. You'll be a better parent. You'll be more patient. You'll be more loving. You'll be less anxious. You'll be all those things because you just spent time becoming more like Jesus. Practicing spiritual disciplines is not selfish. Here's number five. Spiritual disciplines are expected, not suggested. When you open up God's Word, in fact, I want to encourage you to take your copy of God's Word and look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I want to show you a few things that repeat in Matthew chapter 6. In fact, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, when I say open up a copy of God's Word and you're like, "Ah, man, I wish I had one, well, today you have one. So just reach underneath the chair in front of you, put your name on that Bible, take it home with you. We want everyone to walk out of here with a copy of God's Word if you don't own one. All right, so Matthew chapter 6. What you're going to notice is all throughout Matthew chapter 6, there's a wording that repeats itself over and over again. And what it's going to say is it's going to say about spiritual disciplines, when you do this spiritual discipline, instead of if you do this spiritual discipline. In fact, it opens up with the the spiritual discipline of giving. And it says, when you give, not if you give. Two times we see when you give, when you give. And then it goes on to talk about the spiritual discipline of prayer. And it says, when you pray. It doesn't say if you pray. Three times it says, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. And then it goes on to a spiritual discipline called fasting. And it says, when you fast, It doesn't say if you fast. These are things that we recognize in Scripture that all of us have been been, been given an example. These are things that are expected of us as followers of Christ. They're not just good suggestions. And that leads us to number six. If you stay in Matthew Matthew chapter six, I'll show this one to you. It says, spiritual disciplines are meant to glorify God, not you. You. Spiritual disciplines have been given to us to bring glory to God, to highlight his goodness, to put the spotlight on him. Many of us like to take the spotlight and redirect it to ourselves, right? And you look at Matthew chapter 6. Let me show you just three passages. Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 starts with this. It says, watch out. Don't do good deeds publicly to be admired by others. 
Like, in other words, when you're, when you're giving or serving other people, don't do it in such a way as to get the glory. Don't do it so that people admire you. Do it for the right reasons, to glorify God. Matthew 5 or 6, 5 says, when you pray, remember, it doesn't say if you pray, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. If you keep going in Matthew 6 to verse 16, it says, and when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. Essentially, people would walk around and make sure their hair was all a mess and walk around and be like, oh, just hoping someone would ask. I used to work with this woman named Wanda. And Wanda, I was in one office and she was right outside the office door at a desk and every once in a while Wanda would go, oh my I knew exactly what Wanda wanted. She wanted me to say, what's going on, Wanda? Right? But one time, just to see what would happen if I said nothing, I just said nothing. And she repeated herself, but louder. Oh, my. Like, do you think she'll do it again? Oh, my. Wanda, what is it? What would you like me to ask you about, right? And she just wanted some attention. She wanted to, to, for me to know that she was having a bad day, and she wanted me to ask about it. She didn't want to tell me about it. She wanted me to ask about it. And some of us like, will go through life, and we'll try to take that spotlight and put it on ourselves. We'll, we'll pray in such a way that we get all the glory. We'll give in such a way, you know, oh, look, uh, excuse me, everybody, I'm writing a really big check. Does anybody know where I'm supposed to put this when I'm done? And we'll, we'll intentionally try to draw the attention to ourselves so that we're glorified, when at the end of the day, all the glory is meant to go to God. So when you practice spiritual disciplines, listen, there's going to be people who notice. In fact, I hope that in your own homes and in your own family, maybe the people who are looking up to you notice some spiritual discipline in your life. That's good. As long as they're noticing you do it and, and their eyes are drawn to God instead of to you. It's okay to pray out loud in front of, I mean, we pray here on Sundays every week. It's not saying don't pray in such a way that other people see you pray. It's saying pray in such a way that God is glorified and not you. Spiritual disciplines, right, are meant to glorify God and not us. Here's the seventh, and maybe the most powerful biblical truth about spiritual disciplines, that spiritual disciplines provide a path to freedom. Spiritual disciplines provide a path to freedom. Remember we were talking earlier about Discipline not really sounding fun. Discipline sounds painful, right? Well, look at this verse in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 says this, Take my yoke upon you. Now, if you don't really know what a yoke is, let me explain this for you real quick. Jesus isn't saying, you know, take an egg and split it and just take the yellow part and you know, no, he's not talking about that kind of egg yolk. He's talking about a farming tool, right? If you have two, uh, it, uh, two oxen that are going to plow a field together, what you do is you'd put something around their neck, and it's called a yoke. It would yoke them together. And it was essentially a big wooden heavy block that would go around their necks. And when one would pull, the other would have to pull. And they would all have to go in the same direction, right? You could yoke three oxen together, two. just depends on how tough of a job. But, but the idea of wearing a yoke means you're going to work. It doesn't sound pleasurable, right? Nobody wants to, to have to plow a field and to drag this big, heavy uh, wooden block around their neck. And so when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, that doesn't sound enjoyable. That kind of discipline sounds painful. But here's what he continues to say. He says, let me teach you. In other words, the reason why you want to be yoked to Jesus is you want to go where Jesus is going. Wherever Jesus is leading, you want to be right there next to him. You want to be going in the same direction. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. 
and you will find rest for your souls. See, this is sounding a whole lot different than the concept of, of a heavy yoke around your neck that's just meant to burden you as you plow a field. Jesus is saying, listen, I've got something. Listen, you, go to work. Spend time with me. Do things my way. Go where I go. But let me, let me, let me tell you this, that my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. See, spiritual disciplines might be tough for us to get a hold of. They might be hard for us to work into our lives, but the result of a spiritual discipline is rest for our souls. Remember that verse in Hebrews we read a little bit ago where it says, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening, it's painful. Remember that one? Well, that verse goes on and says, but afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. The reason we discipline our children, the reason I'm okay with the occasional infliction of pain on my children is because I know that the long-term result of that discipline, right, afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for all who are trained. Psalm 119, 67 and 68, it says, I used to wander off until you disciplined me. There's that word discipline. I used to wander off until you disciplined me, but now I closely follow your word. You are good and do only good. Teach me your decrees. Why in the world do we want to be disciplined? Because discipline provides us the path to freedom. On the other side of discipline is freedom. It's a, it's a peaceful uh, rest for our souls. If you keep reading and go all the way into the New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 25 says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law, that sets you what? Free. Say it again. That sets you? Free. Right there, James says, if you spend time in this book, it sets you free. If you do that, it sets you free. And then if you do what it says, and don't forget what you have heard, then God will bless you for doing it. You see, spending time with God in worship and in rest and in time in his word and in prayer, all of these spiritual disciplines and more, there's a lot of spiritual disciplines we could have talked about. All of these things lead to freedom. You'll experience rewards here in this life. You'll experience eternal rewards. Remember that verse in Timothy? I'm not going to put it back on the screen, but there's, what was that verse? Um, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Both, we get these rewards on both sides. But you know what the ultimate reward of spiritual discipline is? You get to spend time with God. And that should be the most incredible reward that you, in, in the experience of opening up God's word, in the experience of spending time talking to him in prayer, the discipline of those things, the reward from them is that you got to spend time with your creator. So as we ask the question, what now, God? I hope that whenever these words pop up on the screen, you ask yourself these three words. You don't really ask yourself, but you're asking God, God, what do you want me to do in light of this? And I want to challenge you to do two things. Number one, if you haven't already, I want you to create a rhythm of prayer in your life. To create a rhythm of prayer. I want to be vulnerable with you for just a moment. It's probably about a month ago that I realized that my own personal rhythm of prayer was so offbeat, was almost non-existent, that I was just struggling. Like, why am I having a hard time spending time in prayer? Prayer has never been easy for me. It's always been something I've struggled with. It's not my spiritual gift. It doesn't come naturally for me. But I found myself just kind of prayer, my prayer life was just crap, all right? And so my wife and I, we went to a, a pastor's retreat in Wisconsin. And I spent the week there. It was kind of unplugged, turn off the devices and getting off of social media and just uh, spending time in God's word. 
And I also spent time reading this book called The Life You've Always Wanted. And it was a book all about spiritual disciplines. And between that book and, and what God was showing me in his word, I wanted to share with you a few things that I personally found helpful. Maybe if you struggle with prayer also, you'll find these helpful. One of the things I wanted to, to encourage you when it comes to creating a rhythm of prayer is establish a regular time in a regular place. Just pick a place in your home, a place in your office, place maybe in your car. I don't know where, some place where you're like, this is where I know I'm gonna meet with God in prayer. And pick a regular place and a regular time. Another thing that was really incredibly helpful to me is, is sometimes it might be helpful to pray out loud. I know that God hears my thoughts. I know I can pray to God in the quietness of my spirit and that he hears me. But for whatever reason, for me, my prayer life when I pray out loud is so much more healthy than when I pray quietly. I just get too distracted. My thoughts and all, I mean, I just get way overly distracted and just praying out loud allows me to, to, to just, I don't know, it's better for me and maybe it'll be better for you. But that, that third thing I wanna encourage you to think about is if your mind wanders while you pray, that's okay. In fact, let me encourage you. I used to think, well, I'm so distracted. My mind wanders to this and wanders to that. And I'm just, God, I'm a terrible prayer. I'm so sorry. But pray to God, pray to him and talk to him about wherever your mind's going off to. Maybe he's wanting to talk to you about that thing your mind keeps wandering to. Maybe you're so distracted and you're constantly thinking about the thing you have to do next that as your mind wanders over there, you can just say, well, while I'm thinking about this, God, this is clearly an area that we should probably talk about. Talk to him about whatever's on your mind and heart. In fact, we see in Psalm 62, it says, oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him for God is our refuge. You know, one day I recognize that my kids will all be old, older, and they'll all be out of the house, God willing, right? They'll be out of the house. It'll be a good thing, but I'll want to talk to them. And I, if I had to choose between them calling me and talking about what they want to talk about or not calling at all, I'd much rather hear them call and talk to me about what's on their heart did not hear their voice at all. And maybe you had this, uh, we understand the illustration of like a child crawling up into your lap and talking to you right before bedtime. And as you're chatting a little bit, you kind of see them dozing off to sleep. I used to struggle with the idea of praying at night because, you know, I, I was afraid I'll fall asleep if I try to pray right now. Listen, God would love it if you'd crawl up on his lap and talk to him as you fall asleep. So we need to break break down a, a couple of these things and just recognize if your mind wanders, if you're a little tired, all those things are okay. Just spend time talking to God. Here, here's a fourth thing I want to encourage you to consider is give up the whole one right way to pray idea. Sometimes we can get so stuck in that I have to have this overly spiritualized version of prayer that until I figure that out and I get that rhythm and my mind can stay focused, uh, that's the way to pray. But the truth is that God certainly gave us a model, right? He gave us the Lord's Prayer. But do you know what the Lord's Prayer really is? It's an outline for us. There's four parts to the outline. And the, the prayer that God modeled for us through Jesus. Jesus says, listen, when you pray, you're essentially saying, thank you, God. I need help. So do other people. Thank you. So when you go to God in prayer, you can simply go to him and say, number one, God, you're good. Tell him all the ways that he's good. Thank him for all the great things that, that, that make him who he is in your life. Just talk to him about those things. And then tell him about things that you need in your life, some areas that you know you need some help. That's where you're confessing things. And God, I'm really screwing up on this and I'm not sure what to do about that. And I could really use some direction here. Talk to him about areas you need help and then talk to him about areas where other people that you know and love need help. We see that in the Lord's Prayer. And then really, it eventually, it just goes down to thanking Jesus for being so good. The second what now I want you to consider is creating a rhythm of time in God's Word. 
So really two, two rhythms here. Create a rhythm of prayer and create a rhythm of time in God's word in your life. Let me challenge you with two passages of scripture. Psalm 1, 1, all right? So right at the beginning of the book of Psalms. Listen to this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. I want to be like a tree planted next to the river where my roots are going down deep, where, where the, my leaves never wither and, and I prosper in everything that I do, bearing fruit in each season. If you want that kind of a life, it's going to take a spiritual discipline of a rhythm of time in God's word. How about Psalm 119, 105? Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. What we learn is that God's word is like a flashlight at night and it shows you, it illuminates the ground around you and it shows you where you should step and where there's a, a hole or where there's a rock or where you should go around and it guides your life. Spending time in God's word will help illuminate the path for you so that you know where to go and where not to go. It's a lamp unto your feet. So we wanna create this rhythm of time in God's word really kind of some of those same things. Find a regular time and a regular place and spend time in God's word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for being a God who's given us some incredible truth of, of rhythms that, that we get to put into our lives to become more like Jesus. Thank you for showing us the value of worshiping regularly on a daily basis, individually and weekly in a corporate setting to worship you. God, thank you for the reminder that we need to have a rhythm of rest in our lives. We need to, to have set aside times where we just intentionally hit pause on everything else and just rest our minds and our bodies and our souls. God, thank you for the reminder that the path to freedom comes from spiritual disciplines like these, including spending time in your word and spending time talking to you in prayer. Thank you that we see this path that leads to freedom. It leads to prosperity. We provide, that you provide rest for our souls as we, we practice these things. I pray that we'd be a church that does this for your glory, that we do it regularly, that we, we take ownership of those things and that we work them into our lives ultimately so we can become more like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.